Welcome to the second lesson in this Bible study series on the book of Proverbs. In our first lesson, I introduced wisdom literature and the place of Proverbs in non-literate societies. Proverbs, historically, have been an important part of transferring life wisdom to the next generation. I shared a few African Proverbs and asked whether our own modern society is progressing or digressing since we no longer emphasize the internalization of proverbial wisdom. Proverbs, more than any other book of the Bible, encourages the internalization or memorization of its wisdom. Hello, my name is Sean Tyler, and I welcome you to our study on the Old Testament book of Proverbs. In this lesson, we shall narrow our focus from proverbial wisdom found in many cultures to the book of Proverbs found in the Bible's Old Testament. Providing a background to this book will be essential to better understanding its place, importance, and message. So let's begin. Proverbs is the 20th book of 39 in the Old Testament. It contains a collection of teachings, warnings, and sayings concerning wisdom and profitable conduct. Proverbs is one of the five books placed together and called the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. The others include Job, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, sometimes called the Song of Solomon. Though the writing of Proverbs was completely under the teaching and dispensation of the divine laws of Israel, the book of Proverbs surprisingly contains much worldly wisdom. And in fact, except for just nine verses, Proverbs has almost nothing to say about worship and sacrifice. Let's look briefly at these nine verses. Two verses mention offerings, vows, and feasts, but give neither positive nor negative comments about them. The writer simply refers to the acts of worship within the context of the principle he is emphasizing. The first is found in chapter 7, verse 14. I have fellowship offerings at home. Today I have fulfilled my vows. And, chapter 17, verse 1, Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. A few scholars argue the feasting referred to in chapter 17, verse 1 is not connected to spiritual feasts commanded by God in the Old Testament. However, most scholars suggest the feasting mentioned here does have spiritual emphasis. That would make more sense because it heightens the contrast intended in the proverb of spiritual devotion compared to a house full of strife. Four proverbs make negative comments on the sacrifices and prayers of the wicked. These proverbs include chapter 15, verse 8, line A, says, The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked. And again, in chapter 21, verse 3, To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. This verse resonates with Samuel's judgment of King Saul when he failed to kill all the Amalekites and their livestock in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Because of Saul's failure to obey, Samuel declared the kingdom of, of Israel would be torn away from Saul and given to another who was better than him. We learn later that it would be David, a man after God's own heart. The third verse found in chapter 21, verse 27 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable, how much more so when brought with evil intent. And the fourth and final verse is found in chapter 28, verse 9. And it says, if anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable. The book of Proverbs emphasizes the need to be pure of heart and motive when participating in religious worship activities. The act of worship itself without a proper heart is detestable to the Lord. This underscores an important religious principle to those who would seek to be wise. True worship begins and flows from the heart and is not acceptable to God if it is outward action only. Three Proverbs make positive comments about tithes and prayers. The first says in chapter 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with your wealth, 
with the first fruits of all your crops. The second is part B of a proverb we have already read in chapter 15, verse 8. But the prayer of the upright pleases him, that is God. And the third is found in chapter 15, verse 29, which says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. These nine verses, remember I divided chapter 15, verse 8 into two sections above, constitute all the wisdom given by the book of Proverbs on the religious activities of God's people. Though few, they still strike to the very heart of what makes our worship acceptable or detestable in the eyes of God. A wise man would do well to follow these important proverbial principles in his worship of God. It is also interesting to note that Proverbs does not speak of Israel's heroes, other than a brief mention of King Solomon and King Hezekiah in unit titles. Proverbs does not mention a single prophet. It says nothing of Israel's history, its fate, or its future glory. It speaks nothing of personal immortality or the resurrection. Proverbs does not contain priestly or prophetic wisdom teaching. The primary purpose for Proverbs is to warn against dangerous conduct, while encouraging behavior that promotes personal, familial, and social well-being. Proverbs is a guide to right living. It is human wisdom, the fruit of human experience. It is a how-to book on moral living, profitable conduct, and success in life. Let's look for a moment at the name of the book. Proverbs actually has a title included in its very first verse. The book begins, The Proverbs of Solomon, Son of David, King of Israel. Proverbs also includes a longer subtitle in chapter 1, verses 2 to 6, that begins, For Attaining Wisdom and Discipline. This long subtitle begins a purpose statement for the entire book. So where did we get the name Proverbs? The Hebrew Bible actually calls it Mizle Selomo, which means the writings or comparisons of Solomon. When Hebrew scholars translated the Old Testament around 250 B.C. into the Greek language, the book of Proverbs was called Paroimie. A prominent church historian of the 4th century named Eusebius, around 340 A.D., called it Masal. The meaning of this Hebrew word Masal and its various translations seems to be an authoritative teaching on likeness or comparison. Thus, the intention of Proverbs was to gather a collection of brief sayings that set one image beside another to make a direct or indirect comparison. Of course, not every saying in Proverbs compares two things. Some Proverbs make a single observation, while others extend beyond a single image to tell a story. The name Proverbs did not appear until Jerome in 382 A.D. He was an ancient church father who translated the Hebrew Bible into Latin, the language of the Roman Empire. Scholars call his translation the Latin Vulgate Bible. In Jerome's translation, the book was called Proverbia. Our modern-day name comes from the Latin translation of the Bible and the Latin word Proverbia. Now let's look for a minute at the outline of the book. Most scholars teach that Proverbs consist of nine identifiable literary units, most of which are set apart by what are called superscriptions or titles. These superscriptions actually exist in the ancient manuscripts and are included in most of our modern Bible translations. Let us open our Bibles and look briefly at these literary units and their titles. Let me also mention that seven of the units have titles in the ancient manuscripts. Two of the nine literary units do not have titles. There exists some debate among scholars about the number of literary units actually found in Proverbs. But for our study, let us identify the nine literary units most commonly held by scholars. <music> 
As we've mentioned, the first unit title is found in chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. This literary unit with its title includes chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 9, verse 18. The second unit title begins chapter 10, verse 1. Here it says, The Proverbs of Solomon. This literary unit continues from chapter 10, verse 1, all the way to chapter 22, verse 16. The third unit title is located between chapter 22, verse 16, and verse 17. Look there and see that it says, Sayings of the Wise. This literary unit includes the proverbial wisdom from chapter 22, verse 17, to chapter 24, verse 22. The fourth unit title begins in chapter 24, verse 23. Here we find the words, These also are sayings of the wise. This short section includes only 12 verses from chapter 24, verse 23, to the end of the chapter in verse 34. The fifth unit title is actually verse 1 of chapter 25. This title reads, These are more proverbs of Solomon, copied by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. This lengthy title also provides an important time marker for the compilation of the book that we will discuss later. This section includes Proverbs from chapter 25, verse 1, to chapter 29, verse 27. Let me also note that this section's content is stylistically similar to the second unit of Solomon's Proverbs, but contains more references to the king and his court. The sixth unit title is found at the beginning of chapter 30, verse 1. Here we find our first unusual title. It reads, The Sayings of Agur, son of Jaka, the Masaite, an oracle. The general belief is that this section includes chapter 30, verse 1, to verse 14. Who is Agur, and where does he come from? These are points we will discuss later as we study through this series on Proverbs. The seventh unit, identified by scholars, does not have a title or superscription. It consists of six numerical sayings found in chapter 30 between verses 15 and 33. We will talk about what the numerical saying is and how it functions later in this series, and I'll give my own theory about how this section fits into Proverbs in just a minute. The eighth unit, title, is located at the beginning of chapter 31, verse 1. Again, we find another unusual superscription for the book of Proverbs. It reads, The sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. This short unit includes the proverbial sayings from chapter 31, verse 1, to verse 9. Who King Lemuel is, and why his mother gives advice, provides us with an intriguing mystery to solve in a later lesson. The last literary unit begins in chapter 31, verse 10, and goes through verse 31. There is no title in the original manuscripts, though our modern Bibles often call it the wife of noble character. It is a passage that most Christian women are very familiar with. I believe Hebrew scholars may have intended Proverbs to have seven distinct units, a number of significance to Hebrews, rather than our modern division of nine. Our modern-day scholarship has been unable to explain sufficiently why or how the two untitled units fit into the book's structure and thus separate them into distinct units without a superscription following the example of the Septuagint. I believe the numerical sayings are actually an expansion of Agur's teachings, and the last literary unit, the poem about the wife of noble character, is meant to be a conclusion to the book of Proverbs, just like chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, is the introduction. We shall look at these divisions of literary units and their function within the structure of Proverbs in more detail as we go forward. Let me add another note here. Because of time constraints, we unfortunately will not be able to study all of the Proverbs individually. However, we will attempt to look at different kinds of Proverbs in all of these sections. Now let us turn to the authorship of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. 
Traditionally, church fathers and Bible scholars identify Solomon as the author of Proverbs due to the tradition of his wisdom. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 10-12, to 12, and another spot in 5, verse 12. And more importantly, because of the title found in chapter 1, verse 1 of the book. Solomon's wisdom is first described in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5-14. to 14. Let's read this for a better understanding of Proverbs' title. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I'll give you a long life. A couple of chapters later, in 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 12, it records this note. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom, just as he had promised. Though titles for units 1, 2, and 5 attribute the Proverbs to Solomon, other names also appear connected to collections. Agur is identified as the author of Unit 6, chapter 30, verses 1 to 14. And King Lemuel and his mother is credited as the source of wisdom for Unit 8, chapter 31, verses 1 to 9. Modern scholars believe the book of Proverbs is actually an anthology or collection of Proverbs and sayings with its individual units coming from various periods of Israel's history. Some scholars even suggest that Units 3, 4, 6, and 8 originated from non-Israelite sources, but were later edited and shaped by Hebrew authors. If this is true, it would make Proverbs an international collection of wisdom sayings, perhaps the most comprehensive book of wisdom of its time. Tradition, however, attributes all of Proverbs to King Solomon. An interesting problem arises when we read from 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 to 34. It says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezrahite, wiser than Heman, and Kalkal and Darda, the sons of Maho, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. This passage claims Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs and composed 1,005 songs on topics such as plants, animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. The book of Proverbs does not contain 3,000 proverbs, and Psalms contains only two songs credited to Solomon. So where are all of Solomon's proverbs and songs? Did he write and speak that many? If so, why are they not preserved in the Bible? Did something happen to them? We simply do not know the answers, and the scholars will debate these questions for years to come. 
The most likely conclusions for attributing the authorship of the book of Proverbs to King Solomon comes from the ancient writing traditions. While Solomon may have written much of Proverbs, other parts could have been added later and attributed to Solomon. This was a common practice in ancient times as a courtesy, to honor famous men, and to claim some of the status that their name might bring to the added section of writing. This practice is well documented in non-biblical writings of the same period and is the driving force for developing the pseudepigrapha, meaning false inscription. Some of the books in that collection include 1st and 2nd Enoch, The Life of Adam and Eve, The Psalms of Solomon, and Testament of the Patriarchs. I currently believe, with his international connections, King Solomon wrote much of Proverbs himself, and that he could have personally collected other parts of wisdom literature contained in the book. This would make Solomon the author, editor, of Proverbs. The final form may still have been shaped and edited by Israel's learned ancient men. Regardless of the authorship question, Proverbs has proven its wisdom through the ages and is certainly worth our study and application today. The final topic I wish to cover in this introduction to the book of Proverbs is the book's date. Proverbs' final collection and arrangement appears to have developed over a lengthy period of time with editors bringing together separate collections of sayings. Five major arguments support this theory. Let's look at these reasons. First, scholars note signs of literary disunity within Units 2 and 5, specifically in writing style, content, and grammar. This leads scholars to believe that smaller literary units existed independently before they were later gathered into a larger collection. Second, the Greek Septuagint version of Proverbs actually contains more material, about 130 more Proverbs, than the Hebrew translation, and it arranges the units into a different order. Some scholars believe the different order is intended to group non-Israelite sources together. The Septuagint arranges Proverbs in the following order. Unit 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to chapter 9, verse 18. Unit 2 is chapter 10, verse 1, to chapter 22, verse 16. And unit 3 is chapter 22, verse 17, to chapter 24, verse 22. Those are the same as the Hebrew. But in the Greek Septuagint, unit 3 is followed by unit 6, which is chapter 30, verse 1 to 14. Then unit 4, which is chapter 24, verses 23 to 34. And that's followed by unit 7, which is chapter 30, verses 15 to 33. Then comes unit 8, which is chapter 31, verses 1 to 9, followed by, going back up to unit 5, chapter 25, verse 1, to chapter 29, verse 27. And then finally, unit 9, which is chapter 31, verses 10 to 31. This different arrangement also suggests independent collections and is one of the strongest reasons for dividing Proverbs up into nine units. A third reason for arguing Proverbs is the compilation of independent collections comes from the fact that the same proverb appears in more than one larger unit. Scholars argue it is unlikely that a single author, King Solomon, would include so many duplicate proverbs. This reinforces the idea that some of the collections existed independently before being brought together into a single collection or anthology. For example, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8 says, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the innermost parts. When you turn to Proverbs chapter 26, verse 22, you find the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. It's the same proverb in two different units. That's two and five. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 24, unit two, it says, A sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He will not even bring it back to his mouth. 
the same proverb repeats in chapter 26, verse 15, unit 5. Proverbs 20, verse 16, in unit 2, says, Take the garment of one who puts up security for a stranger. Hold it in pledge if it is done for an outsider. It repeats exactly in Proverbs 27, verse 13, unit 5. In Proverbs 21, verse 9, in unit 2, it says, Better to live in a corner of the roof than to share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Proverbs 25, verse 24, in unit 5, also says, Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Proverbs 22, verse 3, in unit 2, teaches, The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. The same principle repeats exactly in chapter 27, verse 12, unit 5. In addition to duplicate proverbs, scholars also note the same conclusion is given after the lesson on the ant's hard work in chapter 6, verses 6 to 11, and the lazy man's neglect of his vineyard in chapter 24, verses 30 to 34. Both end by saying, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Scholars also point to brief sayings that occur more than once in identical form. Other phrases occur more than once in slightly different wording, and specific expressions appear in more than one literary unit. These textual duplications and similarities lead scholars to believe at least units 2 and 5 of Proverbs existed as separate, independent units that were later arranged together into a larger collection. The fourth reason for Proverbs being a collection of literary units comes from the historical markers found within the book itself. King Solomon, mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1, and in chapter 10, verse 1, reigned over Israel about 970 to 930 B.C., while King Hezekiah, mentioned in chapter 25, verse 1, reigned about 715 to 686 B.C. The difference of more than 200 years indicates that the final arrangement of the book of Proverbs developed over a long period of time. The fifth reason for Proverbs being a collection of independent units gathered together comes from what we know about the assembly of the Old Testament. Proverbs' final Hebrew form probably developed between Hezekiah's time and the translation of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek Septuagint around 250 B.C. Most likely, as some scholars argue, Proverbs was finalized during the 5th and 4th centuries B.C., by the Hebrew schoolmasters of the Jewish diaspora who used Proverbs as a teaching manual to educate their young men of the wealthier class. In this introductory lesson of the book of Proverbs, we have looked briefly at the religious worship content in Proverbs, its purpose how the book came to be called Proverbs, the general outline of the book including its nine literary units and superscriptions, its potential international sources with final authorship attributed to Solomon, and the dating of the final version of the book. These topics give us an overall view of the book's history, structure, and compilation. In the next lesson, we will begin our study of the content and literary techniques used in the first unit of the book of Proverbs. Thank you for listening. I hope you have learned something new about the book of Proverbs and that your interest and love for the book is already growing. With this foundation, we can begin a solid textual study of Proverbs in our next lesson. Until next time.